Hello, everyone. I think it's the right moment to officially start our uh, webinar. So uh, today we will talk about maintenance and how to optimize it. Uh, my name is Lukas Meyer. I'm a marketing director at Novacura. And today I have a very special expert together with me, uh, Ersten Westman. He is a sales director at Novacura. I hope Ersten will tell a few words about himself uh, in a couple of seconds. Okay, thank you, Lukas. Uh, my name is Justin Westman, and uh, it's really, it's quite exciting actually to have this type of live webinar on on April first, uh, this Friday. I'm sitting right now in the Sandefjord in in Norway, and I hope we have a lot of people viewing this, and we really appreciate you taking time over lunch to be part of this. And we have uh, quite a simple agenda. We will, uh, I will introduce. Uh, what, how we look up on maintenance and what we mean about maintenance. Maintenance is a huge area. There is uh, basically nothing in this world that, that doesn't need maintenance one way or another. We will try to show you uh, some uh, very uh, specific uh, solutions, uh, examples from, from our customers, uh, ideas and thoughts that we have in this area. And we will try to summarize this at the end. So first, an introduction into how we look up on maintenance. It, it's very easy to think of maintenance, uh, having skilled people working on assets one way or another. It, it's, uh, uh, we, we often see issues when we have poor maintenance. If it's on, in, our, in, in, in private, in your own house, or if you see it from a, a big service provider, or if you see it somewhere else, bad maintenance affects us very negatively in, in our day-to-day -day life. But maintenance is also not an, an isolated island. Maintenance is part of, of the whole picture. And a lot of people, uh, uh, they, they have sometimes a little bit hard to actually get the total picture of the asset management scope because everything we have, everything that we invest in is basically asset that we would like to maintain and operate in a way that we actually can get the benefits and use it um, for, for the planned life cycle and also to extend the life cycle of equipment. It's, uh, it's really bad from an economic, financial and resource perspective to, to perform bad maintenance because we will wear out our, our assets uh, in a much higher tempo than planned. Uh, Personally, I, I, uh, I have not been paid by Leo Hag, Barry and Thomas Hendrickson, but I must say that this book is, a, is, is extremely valuable for me personally. I think they present uh, this world-class maintenance concept in, in, in a very, uh, very good way in this book. And I really recommend everybody working in this area to, to actually invest in this book. And the, the big question is that in theory, they describe it uh, quite clear, but how do we actually implement these type of theories into the real, into the real life? And uh, you, you've probably seen this picture many times in many different shapes and forms from uh, a lot of suppliers and, and actors in this uh, domain. But uh, this wheel of, uh, of continuous improvement is actually what it's all about. And in the center, we have the asset information. And anyone who's been, who had the fortune or unfortune to meet me earlier know that I'm, I care a lot about the actual quality of the asset information there in the center. But if we look on a higher level from, from a problem point of view, if you look at the sub process for operate and maintain, uh, there is quite often that we actually work in a, in, in a non-optimal process. It could be that we have a, a, a combination of manual and automatic steps. It could be that we are working digitally. We use paper sometimes. It could be that we are lacking some type of standard or we don't have checklists. There, there's, uh, sometimes we lack the competence or, or actually having people that actually have the competence. And, and it's also sometimes a, a way of define what is actually pre preventive and predictive actions. And another critical issue, uh, which is also equally important, is that the way how we are organized. Uh, sometimes in, in some companies, in some organization, 
for, for different reasons, they are in, in quite clear silos. They're, they're are, they are working very independently in their different departments, in their dif different units. And this is um, uh, particularly uh, unlucky or, or, or not, uh, it's not an optimal situation when you actually separate production and maintenance resources too much. Of course, there is some logical uh, separation, but uh, in general, from a maintenance uh, objective perspective, the, the cooperation between maintenance and operations is very critical. To be able to measure and analyze, to, to actually have data quality in your different solutions, where you have accuracy, you, you have the right frequency, you have the, it, it's objective data, it's not biased uh, from, from some um, opinions, it, it, it's, it's data that you can actually uh, evolve into information. There could also be several areas where you don't have possibility to actually connect to your processes. Uh, it could be you, you're lacking different type of measuring tools. It could also be that you also are uh, under a, a black box situation, meaning that uh, you don't actually have insight. You have you have production, you have some type of performance, but it's actually executed by someone else. It could be a subcontractor. It could be from a, from a solution point of view that you don't have access to the data within that step in the process. Uh, but when you do and when you measure, when you analyze, you always get good uh, actions. You always get good ideas that you would like to, to plan improvements on. And uh, if you're doing this uh, planning and if you, have the, if you have bad quality in the data or a limited perspective, it is, it is much, much harder to actually implement improvements. Uh, in some cases, I have seen that you, you, you need to work very, very hard to actually keep the current level, not to actually decrease your production, decrease your availability, that you're actually fighting very hard to maintain the current level. Uh, another thing, in, in some organizations, they are also, they have very good capabilities and, and support to actually predict and simulate. They are using their current data in order to do a new simulation, if we change these parameters, what will actually happen with the overall process? And I think that is something that is coming much more in the future. There is a lot of there's a lot of efforts going on right now, uh, and also historically, there are some industries. If you look at nuclear power plant, if you look at the aviation industry and, and many others with them, they have been very good at using their current data. But I think we we seeing this strategy moving into new areas as well, new industries. And at the end of the day, as I always talk about, to actually have the correct asset information. This is the backbone of any type of operation and maintenance. If you lack or if you have faulty information about your asset, you will always be in a bad situation, whatever you do. You need to have an ongoing process to always maintain and improve your asset information, the quality of that. And uh, we, we talk about spare part information. That is probably the, most, the one significant, most important connection that you do to your asset, to actually have the correct spare part with the associated suppliers, your, your current uh, quantity on hand in your inventory, et cetera. Uh, missing document, documentation is also a, a serious problem. Uh, to, to actually have uh, no documentation at all or actually having the wrong document, the wrong version of a document could be equally bad for your, for your health and safety, for instance. Uh, technical specifications, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very easy from your project phases that you miss the opportunity to actually move the information as designed, as built into the as maintained phase to actually represent the same information in all, all of those project statuses. Uh, a a sub-optimized maintenance strategy, meaning that you, you put a lot of effort into doing inspections that doesn't have any effect, or you, you, you're doing your maintenance too early, you, you have invested in, in new components, uh, you done redesign of your process, but you haven't actually updated the interval for your maintenance actions. You could do totally obsolete maintenance action in the worst case, meaning that you stop production to do a, a maintenance action that doesn't actually have any effect. I, I think 
I think most of, of the companies out there, and I think there is a, it could be a, a difference in different uh, geographical areas, in different uh, subcontinents, etc. Uh, I, I normally take the example of if you look at the hydropower industry in in, in Scandinavia, Finland, northern part uh, in the Nordics, basically, where we have uh, power plant, uh, hydropower plants that have been up and running for 70, 80, 90 years and still producing, and they're producing on the on the on the performance level, uh, 99% plus availability. And then you look at, at newly built power plants in, in other areas of the world where, where the actual life cycle are at the end because of bad maintenance already after 15, 20, 25 years. And, and that is sort of, that imbalance is, is uh, e extremely critical for, for, uh, for many countries, I would say to actually become more professional and more uh, bring up the level of maintenance in their operation. Another important topic for me is that uh, working with uh, some type of, of good decision support for, for maintenance people. And there are, there are a lot of reasons uh, for uh, what, what will happen if you have bad or poor decision support. So if you lack the operational data, you lack uh, historical data, you will have bad analysis, you will make bad operational decisions, and in, at the end also have bad strategical decisions regarding investments, uh, uh, what we can uh, outsource, et cetera, et cetera. And that will, uh, without any exception, lead to higher maintenance costs and lower quality. And at the end, you, you will have lower performance, lower availability in your in your facilities. And if you if you look at the problems, and if you look at from a from a bottom up perspective, so it will actually you will actually affect the maintenance personnel, the operators of the of the of the facilities with this uh, uh, lack of information. You will have a bad decision situation for your mid-level managers and that will eventually lead up to to uh, really really tough decisions on, on the sea level where they might base very critical uh, investment decisions on 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 the poor decision uh, on, on poor information and, and lack of support for their decision if you look if you look at it from another perspective uh, I think some of you might have been uh, facing me in a whiteboard when I draw this sort of reverse organization structure. But basically, if we could have the support from, from our C level in advance, we could actually get our mid manager, mid level managers to support our, our maintenance personnel and our operators in a better way. And we will have increased operational efficiency. And there are many organizations today that have taken big steps in actually reversing this structure in terms if we when we talk about efficiency and availability in our facilities because there are very few people in real life that could actually uh, fine-tune a, a, a complex and advanced process we are talking individuals in organizations that actually consist of hundreds of people and if we if we could support the people who actually could improve the efficiency, we would have a different sort of uh, there would we would have a much better process for this continuous improvement, I believe. So who, who am I? Who who are Novacura to to talk to this audience? And uh, if if we go inside our company, and if you ask me, I never had a work, I never had a job within maintenance. I, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I try to maintain my own house uh, as good as possible. Uh, but uh, we we don't we're not maintenance experts. You have other suppliers, other partners who actually help you with the physical parts of a process line, of a pulp and paper process, of, uh, in the mining operation or in the steel mill, etc. But we have solutions. We have solutions that have been proven uh, in real life uh, for many years, and we also have a tool that could actually help you fine-tune this to your specific needs without tampering with your underlying EAM solution or ERP solution.
So if we go into some examples, uh, I will first talk about uh, uh, how we could improve the, the mobile application support for, for the actual work order process. The work order process is bigger than what, that what we show in this slide. You, you, before the work assignment, you normally have several ways to generate work orders. You, you can have a fault report from someone in your organization. It could be that you generate from your preventive maintenance. It could be that you have an investment decision that you actually manually prepare work order for, for a new investment. But at some time, we have actually decided that somebody should do this work. And at that point, it becomes more individual. There are organizations that are sort of working on a department or team level, but normally we also try to suggest that we if you could assign work to a specific person you will also have a bigger impact in actually okay i will take responsibility to do this work and i will report it accordingly so we, we, we assign the work the person who gets the work assigned would like to review and prepare his work and then they will perform the work and at the end they will report what they've done and when they have ticked off that work or that task we will be able to anal uh, do analysis on that basically instantly so what we're talking about here is daily efficiency to actually have access to all your tasks in one place to be to be able to to visualize that based on your role and to actually make it easy and, and actually more fun and enjoyable to work with your daily tasks and if i in in this very simple example here from one of our customers test environment you see that the maintenance personnel actually have access to quite a lot of different process flows here they can create the work report they can uh, they they can uh, do their maintenance inspection routes and they can also do their time reporting some of this is in swedish but i i, I hope we have some swedish speaking people in the meeting as well if we if we move on you you also would like to be able to to uh, uh, report your tasks uh, you could you could work with different type of steps. You will have uh, when you change the status, we will update your the date when you started the work. So there's a lot of automation done uh, in in behind the scenes when you start working. Of course, to be able to work and look at your documents, this is uh, also critical for for many people to be able to have right type of documentation when they're out in the field or out in the asset uh, in, in the facilities working and everything should be at the top of your finger and in this example now you see uh, this work order has actually quite a lot of uh, documents connected to this it could be a, it could be a picture of the fault and it could be some instructions and and some drawing uh, that they need to look at in order to complete this task so daily efficiency is extremely important and also something that we use we, we use templates for, for a certain standard system when we do this work order process but i have never met a customer yet that didn't have some specific need that that it's not it's not um, it's not sort of a, a big difference but it's very important so I, I have come to, I sleep well at night when I think, okay, so if we do things that are 80% good from, from Novacura uh, as a supplier, I have no problem doing sort of configurations and adjustments in Novacura flow the last 20% to make the process fit perfectly for an individual customer. If we move on and look at another simple task, that actually is becoming more and more important for many of our customers. And that is to be able to do spontaneous maintenance by walking around in, in, in the facilities to be able to pick up information quickly and check, is, do we need to do something here? So in this very simple animation here, we, we check two different objects and the second object is, okay, there is a maintenance task that is due on this object here. And if I continue this, uh, this animation, we could also be warned or alerted by moving around in the facilities. We can actually get signals from assets with that capability that there is something else I need to do in, in a nearby object. And if we, if we take an example from, from field service, this is basically when you have one work order you, you need to perform in, in, at, at point A and then you need to travel one hour to point B. If you could pick up one or two more work 
one or two more work orders on that on that uh, travel, you probably will be much more efficient and actually uh, increase the efficiency of both planning and execution if you could put up pick up extra work. If you're moving around in one facility in a in a power plant or or, or whatever facility you have. And if you could pick up those alarms, those alert, you could probably do more work when you're actually out working instead of running back and forth to your to your office or your control room to get the next assignment, etc. Uh, another example is the importance of actually uh, documenting through pictures. Uh, we have one customer up north, Kaunis uh, Iron in, in Kaunisvara, north of Payala. That has been extremely good in doing this. They, they have in their route inspection inspections, they create a lot of fault reports from their route inspections, which is uh, finding a lot of faults is probably not the uh, not the best way to measure efficiency. But but it actually shows that the inspections are giving result. And when they do the fault reports, I would say that more than fifty percent of the fault reports has, has at least one picture or more. And why is this so important? Well, uh, when you do this work, if you if you find the error and you, you can fix it right away, maybe it's not that important, but if you need to document this in order to have a colleague to fix this on the next shift, then it could be extremely important to document it the correct way. So collecting pictures in, in a simple and, and uh, due fashion uh, when you're out working is also important and to be able to mix the medias as well you, you can you can even talk in a, a, a short uh, sequence and and explain by words in a in a uh, audio file instead of actually taking pictures as well or combine the both of them the next example is from the reporting uh, phase uh, it's uh, Historically, I would say, has been a lot of focus on the financial reporting to actually get the hours you spent on a work order, to connect the spare parts you, spare part you use, to, to be able to attach the correct purchase order uh, to the work order in order to collect the cost. But, but I think from an asset information perspective, it's equally important to, to catch the, his, the technical history of the asset as well. So what was the actual uh, fault? What was the root cause? What type of symptoms? What type of priority? What error class, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that soft information, we can help and guide the user to actually report it in, in, in the correct way. And also to be, to, I would like to emphasize on, on this free text uh, also to, to actually in a free text to skip that by just putting in uh, fix the broken pump or, or the pump is broken, it's not good enough. If you spend 30 seconds on describing what the error was, if you, if you spend 10 seconds more to, okay, I think we can fix this if we replace this part, then you will help yourself and you will help your, your, your team, your department, your organization, your company, in order to minimize the downtime. I will come back to this a little bit later on. So if we look uh, on another specific topic then in this area of improving the work order process, if we look at inspections, there, there are many ways of doing inspections and there is also many, many types of inspections. But traditionally in, in the asset intensive environment you do a lot of inspection it could be just a sort of overall inspection it could be you inspect for oil levels you can have cleaning etc etc and when you do this it is extremely important that you could report easily the findings and the findings if you look at this small menu here this is in swedish now but this is the standard menu from from ifs but it's very similar if you look in in, in any given EAM system, you will be able to, to report findings on this level. So you could create a fault report, you could create a, a, a note for the, for the inspection, you can register measurements, uh, you can create a quick work as we call it, you can report another work order quickly if you do some small work on it. Uh, and and this to do this in your inspection and have this connected is, is extremely important for your motivation to continue to do the inspections. If you were, if you are doing inspections today with no reactions on, 
no fault uh, reports, no, no inspection notes, nothing, then you must ask yourself, why are we doing this inspection? I, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, an, an old inspection that is actually obsolete for one reason or another? Uh, is it a mandatory inspection for, for uh, like ventilation or uh, hydraulic components, etc.? Then you should do more, more uh, documentation when you do the inspection. So to, to be able to identify problems from your inspection is actually an important thing. If you have inspections today that are giving you nothing, then you, you must sort of challenge them if you, if you actually need them in, in the future. So another thing that is also coming, we have just launched uh, or, or released, I should say, in, in NovaCare Flow, we have now uh, support for what, what is called BLE, which is uh, Bluetooth uh, with, uh, with a low energy connection. So basically you can hook up any type of BLE uh, component and actually read things from it very easily to actually get a measurement of whatever. And, and the benefit is, is quite obvious that you actually will have fewer mistakes with uh, avoiding a manual entry. And it's, it's safer, you can, you can just pass a specific meter and you will get the information into to your flow. And it's efficiency and it's actually encourage you to start measuring more, which will give you more, more ways of doing analysis. And, and of course, the transparency of actually how this equipment is performing. So that sort of sums up the, this part where we talk about some small ideas, things that we have delivered in, in the work order uh, process for the people actually doing the work. We, we have not talked about the preparation or scheduling, and we have not talked about the analysis yet. So, so let's move into, to, uh, to uh, oh, sorry, we, sh we should take another example here. Uh, if we look how we can get more external support from, from experts that are not on site. So this was a big thing when the pandemic hit us. Uh, there, there were predictions that we would use this type of remote guidance uh, to a much higher degree and, uh, and, and much faster. I think there has been an increase, but it's still sort of in the boiling uh, how to utilize this technology. Uh, Novacure has support for this. We have cooperated with a company called XM Reality, which is very strong in this area. So we could actually have Novacura flow processes in your mobile device where you actually use XM reality technology to get remote assistance from, a, from an expert, uh, fr from a supplier sitting in, in somewhere in Europe and, uh, and helping you on site, giving you instructions and, and advices on site. So this is just another example of how we can enforce the, the maintenance personnel uh, and operators, of course, uh, in their maintenance tasks. So, next area that I would like to touch on is the collaboration with your subcontractors. There is, uh, uh, I, I would say the last 20 years, there has been quite a lot of outsourcing deals uh, in the industry. Uh, some of them has been uh, quite large in terms of field service. Uh, there has also been large uh, outsourcing contracts within uh, sort of asset intensive uh, operations. And it's all about how to collaborate with your, with your partners, your subcontractors. And there is a possible challenge uh, when you have outsourced your, your operation or maintenance uh, that you actually lend, let your, your subcontractors, your partners to own critical asset information. So, so in this example, there, there, there could be that the, your partner is actually using their own solution and you as an asset owner only get some type of aggregated report uh, from your partners and subcontractors. And I, and, I, and I have self been involved in several occasions where I, I have worked with my customer and helped them negotiate terms and, and paragraphs into their agreements with their partners where the asset owner actually have full access and owns the data that they generate in their own operation. 
So I, I would give you this sort of uh, call to action to, to verify that you actually have access to all critical asset information. Uh, and even you could have a very good partnership and you could have very good, excellent services and, and, and your partners and subcontractors are delivering according to your agreement. But in the long run, this type of critical asset information, the be behavior of your, of your asset is important to have access to. There are tools available in the market already. Everybody's talking about IoT and AI. And one of the critical things is that the AI algorithms need to be fed with correct information. Correct information could be your, your purchasing transaction history or your fault uh, reporting uh, frequency or whatever information. And uh, in order to improve this, I think you should have a look at how, how much of your own critical asset information you have full control of. Uh, another thing uh, when we talk about partners and subcontractors is that uh, to actually be, to let them have access to your EAM solution, uh, that is also an agreement issue that you should state in the agreement that they should provide full historic information in your EAM system. If you don't do that, the second best thing is to have a have a full-blown integration between their work order system and your own EAM system. But the absolute best thing is that they actually report in your system and that you actually deliver data to their internal system based on transactions in your system. That is for me the optimal, optimal situation. This, this could be a little bit costly because there, there will be a discussion who, who should pay for this type of integration. Why should we as a subcontractor partner train our people in other systems? But, but I think it's, it is a valid question and something you need to challenge your partners with. Uh, in order, if you, if you have the former slide in your mind, you understand that this is the way to actually get access of some of that information. And in the same, in the same uh, sort of uh, subcontractor and, and partner uh, partnership discussions, there's also a lot of discussion regarding inventory. Uh, there, are, there are many different strategies. Some people, they would like to outsource the inventory as a whole, meaning that they, they want their partners to be responsible, having the correct inventory stock levels to be able to manage the inventory on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, to be able to manage um, uh, external, um, uh, I lost the word for it, what is called when you have uh, uh, consignation was the word I was looking for. When you have consignation partners or vendor managed inventory uh, part, if you, if you have partners supplying you with diesel, oil, whatever, and they are sort of responsible for filling your tanks on, on your site, all of that also needs to have a good tool to be able to keep track of the financial transaction. But the, the inventory is so critical for maintenance to, to actually have traceability and, tra and transparency. What is the actual quantity on hand? What is actually available for me? I'm planning this maintenance stop three weeks ahead. What can I actually use? And what can I, what can I reserve for my needs uh, and, and have a complete view of that? And so all, once again, I will mention Counties Iron. They, they had uh, uh, have this uh, function outsourced before and they had all of their subcontractor was working uh, as one in the in the same EAM solution up in, in Kaunas. Uh, we talked about a problem earlier, I mentioned it as a uh, being black boxed. What, 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 what do we mean by being black boxed? Well, it could be from a technical perspective that you don't, you, you, you have uh, equipment, you have uh, components that are operating with different type of protocols or, or interfaces that you don't have access to. You don't have a, a simple way of collecting the data. You don't have a simple way of storing the data for future needs uh, or future analysis or, or other needs. But it could also be that the, the actual, some, some of the uh, 
some of the subsystems. Uh, if you if you have a process line and and one part of the line is actually not part of your control system, it's actually controlled outside of your ABB or Siemens uh, process control solution. That is also a problem fr from a black box situation, and and this is uh, it, it easily becomes the major bottleneck in some production situation and it easily becomes the biggest problem for your revisions and maintenance stop because there will be you need to have outside expertise to solve your black box issues we would like to increase this flow we would like to increase the 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 frequency of something but you don't have the control of doing it yourself and, and here we can offer one solution to actually read data. I mentioned this Bluetooth low energy part earlier. And then we also have a connector for UPC UA, which is the, uh, uh, the UPC is a protocol that's been around now since they opened up the, the Windows world to, to process control. And, and many of you out there have a, some type of UPC server. And, and uh, the newer one of them also support UPC UA. Uh, and then we can actually, so if you, if you measure temperature every second, we can easily then read one measurement per day as an uh, average measurement of a temperature on a specific test point into your EAM solution. And if, you, if you're working with, uh, with uh, uh, different type of, of mobile machines, uh, trucks, loaders, et cetera, uh, these machines, these type of vehicles today are also extremely strong in collecting data of their operation. So, so there is, there's also machines, but there's also vehicles that, that have these uh, capabilities today. Okay, so now we, we tried to, we talked about examples uh, from quite different areas. Now we'll move into another topic that uh, if you met me before, you you might have heard me said uh, something along this line earlier as well, and that is actually how do we optimize the cooperation and improve the cooperation between production people and, and maintenance people, uh, and and I say people on purpose. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's not a department. It's 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 communication on on an individual level basically that we're talking about that we could support by having the right tools and, and the right uh, technology technology support to improve this communication so if we if we look from a, from a quite basic use case uh, we, we have a, some operator of some kind and uh, they need to change some tool uh, or it could be that there is a problem with the machine so to just to be able to do this tool request on the mobile device, knowing that this will be notified immediately to the best possible resource to help me from, from the maintenance department. To actually have, have that knowledge that I don't have to chase someone, I don't have to call someone, I know that this process is working. This is, this is very, very important. And when I come into this next example, which is a, it's a lot, quite a lot of animations here, but bear with me, I think you will recognize this typical operator and maintenance situation. So we on the upper line, we have production, and then we have the, the people with no faces, which is representing the maintenance personnel in this case. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, normal production, and suddenly we have a stop. And when we have a stop, uh, it, it's uh, human nature, you try to fix it. It's uh, uh, the, the operator try to fix this independently. Sometimes this takes 30 seconds and they will be up and, up, uh, up and running again. It's a simple restart of some, some sort. Or sometimes it could be uh, quite a lengthy process. And the reason why they are trying themselves all the time could be many. Uh, a lot of operators, of course, have, have the skills to fix the problem themselves. But there is also very common that you also have an instruction that you should take help from someone. It could be the, the instrumental or electrical or mechanical department from your maintenance organization. And that could happen in different ways. And uh, we have a situation where they, you, you, you report the problem and you, they will start looking at uh, how to fix it and then they will do the actual repair. And at the end there, uh, we will have some type of startup and we will be back in production. And this, this typical situation will give us uh, a couple of lead times that we could measure. 
so wasted it, it it's a it's a it's a hard word to, but but in some sense this time when we try to fix it independently and failing then the time is wasted and here i here i met customers that have uh, they have you don't you're not allowed to do this alone so there shouldn't be any you shouldn't try to fix different types of problem uh, this is very typical in in, in critical security situations uh, nuclear power plants uh, oil and gas etc uh, and some in some type of operation okay you, you will maximum you have five minutes to try to fix this self otherwise you need to tell take help from someone else uh, when you when you report this uh, we will have a lead time until we start working on this problem which we call mean time waiting so we, we report a problem at 11 30 and then 11 45 somebody comes up and help me with this issue then we have a 15 minute lead time there then we have a, a mean time to repair the time it actually takes to fix this problem uh, and and this is actually normally a lot of people have a, a lot of companies have a sense that it, we i mean when we know what the problem is we are actually quite good at this and i would like to challenge that view because one i have one dear example 20 years back now but the maintenance manager of this company uh, this uh, company in houston in, in usa he forced the technician the, the operator sorry to stand by the machine all the time when somebody from the maintenance department or anyone else were helping them they were not allowed to go outside to have a smoke they were not allowed to go get a cup of coffee I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit now, but they were actually supposed to wait with, uh, with, at the machine until it was helped. And they, were, they, were, they wanted to minimize the wasted time or, or eliminate the wasted time. And they wanted to, to eliminate the startup time by having the operator ready to switch on the machine when the repair was done. But their big gain was actually the mean time to repair. That's where, where they were saving most time. Because when the maintenance person came, uh, he or she could ask, okay, so what, what happened before the stop? Uh, have you seen this before? The operator could help the, the repair person by picking up a tool or fetching a spare part from inventory. So the finding after six, seven months was that, okay, this communication between the production, the operators and the maintenance resource was actually killing this, slashing this main mean time to repair. And that is the idea I would like to, to challenge you all with. So if, if I continue this animation now, you, you recognize you need to calculate a downtime of the actual full production stop. Of course, that, that's a given. You cannot measure it on the time that you spent on the main. You need to take everything in the in consideration. So uh, in this version of it, uh, we have we have automate. There's there's way of automating and shorten the downtime. That is, that is the actual uh, uh, actual purpose of this slide. I, I was a little bit too quick there, uh, Lukas. Uh, so I, I missed that point, but. I think you will have access simply, to simply type the left arrow and it will be back, I hope. Yeah, but, but uh, it's, uh, I, I think everybody gets the picture here. We, we can actually minimize the downtime by communi uh, communicating better between production and maintenance, basically. Short comment on that, if I can interrupt you. Uh, we can easily uh, teach Navakira Flow Engine to recognize the downtime situation and notify maintenance right after the downtime started. And then we can, based on some historical data, we can set some timeout parameter that will automatically call for maintenance help, even if the operator at the production doesn't do that at the proper time. So he can still try to fix the problem but automated solution will call for maintenance help uh, in parallel on behalf of him. Yeah. So that's the, the timer here on the picture. Thank you, Lukas. So uh, moving on then to another situation, uh, which is also quite common, I believe, in, in, in maintenance operation. And that is the when you, we talk about a maintenance window versus a maintenance opportunity. So. Uh, 
today, the, I would say that majority of all maintenance are still based on schedules today. That is my experience at least. And uh, uh, I thought, uh, I mean, my first customer I met was back in 95 with the SCA in Sundsvall, the big pulp and paper manufacturer actually close to production in Sundsvall now. But, but they talked about this a lot that they wanted to switch from calendar to condition based. And I've seen the trend, but for me, it's been tremendously slow, the move from scheduled maintenance to more condition-based or predictive maintenance. But there is a situation, and that is actually in some type of operation, the, the operation is king. And the operation tells me, okay, I will give you a maintenance opportunity on Saturday between four o'clock and eight o'clock in the evening please optimize that maintenance stop and, and do what's necessary and, and try, to, try to fix everything you can in, in those four hours. So if we look at this, that situation, when, when you start that type of stop, there is, there is always a risk that you will find other problems. When you start some type of maintenance work, you can find other root causes. You, could, you can uh, sort of, um, uh, yeah, find problems that you hadn't planned for and and then you you need to so this stop pair is actually that type of problem and what you need to do then is to also be able to plan for a maintenance opportunity that you have already pre-planned work it could be preventive or it could be corrective things that you need to do but they are ready to do it could mean that you also need to call in extra personnel we have an unplanned stop here now for four hours on on saturday afternoon but the cost to actually stop the production once again a couple of weeks later to do this work is so high and and when i look at i mean uh, many years ago almost 20 years ago uh, pm4 or pm5 at SCR costed 72,000. Swedish krona to stop for one hour. I know exactly how much it cost Kaunis Iron, but I'm not allowed to tell you that. But with if, if you look at one day's production in the in the enrichment plant, we're talking multi-million loss on one day. So so to actually be able to squeeze in this maintenance opportunity when you have an unplanned stop could mean a lot of money for you. And we at Novacura, we have done several planning solution that utilizes standard functionality in the EAM system in order to be able to do this replanning of already planned work. So this package, this work package in the future, we could easily move in under this opportunity using that planning tool. And at the end of this, the, the, the result is quite obvious. We, we could actually increase the production and lower the downtime for maintenance. That is what what's this all about. So there will be a delta here of, of increased production based on that we could schedule some task earlier. And it's very important to, to mention that the planned task should have this. Uh, it should be that all the material, what type of competence, uh, what type of tools, everything should be planned for these type of tasks. So it's all about schedule when and who could do this. And, and in good organizations where, where they have a very mature process for this type of planning, they already have known work packages that they can put in there. And we're talking normally also work packages connected to the critical line in the production. So if you have a thousand objects in your production line, maybe 200 of them are essential that they are operating 24-7, 365 days a year. But then you have more uh, more, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, supporting objects that you could, they, or they could be duplicated functions that you could actually turn off and do maintenance even though that production is up and running. So I challenge you also this as a, as a, uh, a call for action to, to scrutinize yourself. Do you have pre-planned packages that you know that you could, if you get an opportunity, that you could actually easily schedule and, and add, re, uh, add uh, people to and start doing them. Meaning that you also have the needed spare parts on your store, in your inventory, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, moving on, 
are we coming closer to the end here now? Uh, you're absolutely right about the timing, Lukas. So I would like to finish off talking about real process in, improvement. We we, uh, we we have talked about this now for 15 years at Novacura. And, and why is Novacura Flow a, a true enabler of this type of improvements? Well, because we think that we fill the gap between people, process, and solution. People means that if you have an organization, you have skilled people, if they don't have proper processes and good functions and IT solutions to support them, it doesn't matter how good they are, they will still fail. If you have well-developed processes, but you don't have skilled people or, or supporting solution, you will also fail. And you can have the best solutions in the world without the processes and the people, and the solution will be empty. You, you, you will not have any information to do analysis on. So, so this gap that we think we fill in a good way, we do it in, in many ways. We can do it on a technical level to help you collect critical data. So through our connectors, we can easily read data from, from independent sources and we can collect the data and we can also present the data in, in a very good way. And this example is that when you do maintenance analysis, it's very easy to focus on cost. And some people also think, okay, but we need to understand the, the effect of lost production. So if, if you're familiar with the overall equipment efficiency uh, acronym there, you, you know that the, the, the cost of product, lost production is probably the biggest cost for you. But you can also need to understand the effect of actually the asset depreciation. If you do an, a, a big investment into your asset, you need to understand there is a cost for this depreciation of this investment that you need to, to cover as well in your business case. So in this example, we have a couple of months here now with, with actuals, and then we have a prognosis, uh, and we use a data source, and we use a simple portlet to present this information, where you could click on these, uh, these um, bars and, and drill down to the, to the individual information objects here. And, and to have this capability to actually pick this up uh, in one picture, I, I think it's a very simple example. But if you ask yourself today, where do you find these three components? So the depreciation, the production loss, and your maintenance cost. Where do you find these three components today? Do you have it easily at your, at, in your palm? Uh, and you can find it uh, when you like. So another example, by, by using a, a, a proper process in work order, uh, on the work order, you, you can actually easily collect with, with, with basic discipline, you easily collect the cost for time spent, spare parts and whatever you, uh, parts and service you need to buy. And you will be able to, to present that in your equipment structure, being able to drill down and do analysis uh, what, it, what does this actually mean? On the other hand, if you combine that information with your production, and, and here is an integration we have with ABB 800, you can easily get the, the tons produced per hour. And when you have a maintenance shutdown, if, if, if you lose $150,000 per maintenance hour, uh, per hour when your production is down, you, you can easily balance that cost against uh, what, what you actually gain for, for having uh, the maintenance done. What, what I'm saying here is it's not, we're not talking about reducing maintenance. I still believe there are many ways of, uh, uh, that you, in many cases you need to, uh, into, you need to uh, increase your maintenance efforts, but you should have tools to optimize your efforts where it should be, uh, where it should be focused. So very quickly, the summary. So we believe, uh, and, and, and we truly believe this, that uh, maintenance is absolutely a key factor for a company's overall success. And, and we think that an optimized maintenance strategy could be achieved in, in smarter ways. And, and we need to feed this ongoing wheel of improvements uh, hour by hour, day by day, uh, year by year, in order to, to be more efficient. 
and we need to be able to utilize the resources in a better way. To measure is critical. A better measurement leads to better analysis and better decisions. And, and we need to, to transform data to real information to get the proper decision support. So that brings me to the end of the presentation phase. So let's move into the questions and answer phase. Yeah, we are running late a bit, uh, but I have several questions on Q&A. So if we can't answer on all of these live now, uh, we will respond to all of them later via email. We have email addresses to all of you. So first question is from Christina. Work order in Flow, are the docs documentation connected to the work order or object affected by the work order? Which solution is the most common? It, 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 it's always connected to the work order. I think it's extremely important to, to actually document the work, but we could easily also connect the same document to the equipment object or the spare part or the actual customer that we are working for. So, so that is a very good example of how we can configure in flow and, and, and where, where different customers, where the different companies would like to have different solutions. Excellent example. I, I, I can maybe comment on that. Uh, if we talk about technical documentation, it's usually connected to the object. It's like, you know, something that is static, uh, connected to object. If we talk I, about- I, I argue a little bit. I, I argue a little bit okay. with you, Luca. It, it's the independent of the, it's dependent on the situation. And, and it should, it's also possible to make different decisions, make, make different selections at different occasions. So I think it, it's a full flexibility the way you would like to land the document. So next question, please. Yeah. Next question is, I, I have chosen the other one is the, is, uh, sorry, I lost the window. It was, are these presented solutions mainly applicable or relevant for asset intensive industries like paper mills, or is it also dedicated for manufacturing companies? Absolutely for manufacturing companies as well. It's, I mean, if you look at the total asset value of a large manufacturer, they, they have, many, many hundreds of millions of dollars in, invested in their assets. And, and, the, and the, production, uh, sort of the production situation is much tougher in many of the manufacturing companies compared to larger process like pulp and paper and, and mining. So, so the, it's absolutely relevant. And, and uh, I, think, I think it's, I find it a little bit strange that big manufacturers are sometimes working on, on the, I, I wouldn't say not, not lower level of, of maintenance solution, but it's the thinking of the actual financial impact of maintenance is the, the understanding that it's lower in, in some large manufacturing companies. That, that is my experience. Thanks. There was one more question important, I think, uh, regarding the Bluetooth lower energy. I will not read it. Uh, just I will tell. Uh, is this Bluetooth lower energy like capability really in use? Is it ready now? Yes, I think it's ready. the obvious answer is it's ready. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah. I mean, we have used that in multiple cases. Yeah. So, it's, so yeah. this is this is one function that has come from from Novacura Labs, and uh, it, it's uh, I I didn't know about it until I read it in our in our marketplace. I, I I didn't I didn't know about the BLE concept actually at all. So. Uh, we have a guy called yeah, but Paul this is Phillips. working solution absolutely yes we need to uh, move on uh so i would like to officially thank you for the participation but uh we also invite you to the usual survey i know we are running late but maybe we can spend a few more minutes on that survey so i will now take control over the screen uh i'll share my survey as usually in Mentimeter, I'm sorry, now I'm sharing. Uh, I'm not sure if you, I hope you see my screen now. So please log in too. Uh, I'll give you a few more seconds to, uh, I, I'd recommend to do it on a mobile device. I see people are coming. So I'll give you a few more seconds. If you can't reach the QR code, you can obviously use the 
go to the www.menti.com and then enter the code. The code will be displayed later when I go to next slide. So I'll, I'll continue now. But the code is up there right on the top. Okay, so first question is with which of the presented concepts are the most valuable for to you? Quite complicated concepts, so descriptions are also a bit long, but we wanted to be very specific in that. I'm not sure if we can uh, access, yeah, it changes now. So I think ability to read data from machines is the favorite. It's also, it's not a big surprise to me because when we had manufacturing session, longitudinal session, uh, this topic as a candidate for the next longitudinal session was also so appreciated the most by the audience. So yeah, this connectivity. The general context is concept is also high. And the third position is opportunity driven maintenance window yeah opportunity driven maintenance that's the the most challenging part if you don't have enough support from the technology from the solution so probably good information for you Esten. that was also Absolutely. your type to some extent yeah uh okay let's move on to the next question i feel like i got stuck you know why Okay, sorry. Yeah. It's an op open question. So without like pre selected options. I think I lost one question that was before it, probably because the Mentimeter was frozen for a while. But now we are here. This is also similar. So I hope someone will share thoughts. This, this is a very important secret. So they don't want to share it. But now we are talking about Novacura, what is expected from Novacura. So this, this I think it's big, not big. a secret. you can always vote for some lower prices or something <laughs> i think we are perfect no no like suggestions regarding what Navacura could tell yeah good better front end functionality more flexible apps on android devices so the comment on that is that we are actually working on a new mobile client and you might be surprised because we just like launched, uh, released the new mobile clients. When I say just, I mean the, the last year, but we are working on the, on, on, the, on a better version now because uh, the last release was actually more related to the technology. So we completely changed the technology but this is also an enabler for us to improve like features that are available and visible for users. So it was a rather like a first step and we are working on it, but fair point. So I will try now something. I will come back to the previous questions. Yeah, we had, we have also one answer on that. What is your current biggest challenge in the maintenance area? And one answer is easy solutions for reporting work ordinance in IFS so probably something that we can easily easily fix with all the mobile applications we have. I don't know if you all can access this question now. I hope you can. So I'll give you some more time. That, that one is interesting as well. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the amount of attributes uh, on the work order, I think I, I, I stopped counting at 150 to actually structuring the data uh, for the user in a, in a proper way in each step of the work order is extremely important. Uh, Can we yeah. comment on the last? Yeah, uh, to prevent, I mean, I mean the, PM. Yeah, there, there are there are many things uh, I would like to say about that. I mean, the to to actually have uh, preventive maintenance, we we have that in many cases, but there is also a need to be able when you when you have a, some type of problem and you create a work or and you fix it, some some organization would like to turn that work order into a preventive maintenance action. So basically the, the spare parts you needed, the time you spent, uh, you actually uh, reverse it and you create the PM action for it and you put it on a calendar or a condition and start using it. At the same thing, same thing when you have done a, a maintenance stop that you actually, the, the final stop for a certain type of, of stop, you would like to, to save as a template for your next uh, for your next uh, uh, next stop that you use as a plan. Joachim has a question, not only attributes, also the fact that, the, uh, click on that, please. Joachim Leren had a, a comment there uh, on the chat. On the chat. Uh... I, I, look at, I can look at the chat there, sorry. Okay, look at it yeah. now, yeah, please. Yeah. So, so not only attributes, uh, uh, yeah, so, so actually the, the value, it's, it's very hard to, from a sizing perspective, to fit some of the attributes in the, in the, uh, in the actual device. Um, I think you, you talk about uh, large text chunks, etc. cetera, Joachim. Uh, I don't know if the new uh, Android and iOS uh, interfaces improve. I think there are some improvements in actually managing those parameters in in the layout of Noikura Flow. Uh, uh, cooperation with service agents, absolutely. Uh, we have several connectors. I, I mentioned the UPC UA. It could also be some something uh, uh, something for uh, uh, using uh, sort of standard REST and OData uh, interfaces to read data. Uh, an online solution for work permit handling. Well. We have, we have a really, really interesting project that we are running together with SSAB up in Luleå, where we have created a standalone uh, work permit solution where the people responsible for the actual uh, administration of work permits have a, a, a map over the facilities. And with different colors, we indicate where we have critical or, or dangerous work and active work permits in order to avoid that we have dangerous work too close to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it, it's, a very, it's a very delicate process to, to go into and digitalize because it's a lot of laws and regulation that, that drives that uh, work permit process. But I definitely think we could make some steps more automated and more secure by using Novacare Flow as a tool. So the one who the one who put in that online solution for work permit is, is uh, welcome to contact me after the after this uh, session as well. So then we can talk more about that. My only comment to the second to last uh, point: the cooperation with service agents. Maybe we we'll talk more about the subcontractors who who perform maintenance activities. So this black box, you know, discussion. Yeah, but about but. Yeah, more general it, it, than just retrieving yeah. data. Yeah, yeah. So it, it could be, it could be, of course, different types of integration. But as I said in the presentation, the the the, before, the 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 preferred situation is that they actually, if they are subcontracting or partner, they should report in your system, and then we can deliver the data to them for their needs. And of, often that need is for their invoicing needs uh, in, in the contract, in the agreement, in the commercial relationship. Yeah, that's that was the strategy you, you you presented earlier. Yeah, I think it's the time to officially thank all of you for the participation for being active during this webinar. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as always, this webinar will be available 
So you will get an email uh, after the webinar and there will be the link to the recording. And as always, the webinar will be also, after some post-processing, will be also available on our YouTube channel as a free content. So if you have, if you would want to, to look at it again and see some details, review some of the presented concepts, it will be available for you, I hope, on Monday, the next week. Again, thank you, Austin. Thank, thank you very much. All of thank you. Thank you for participating. See you. See you next time in the upcoming Lodge and Learn session.